Hello and welcome to Worlds of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Bayt. Tonight we're joined by two brilliant guests, Ms. Marita Bilde, who's a policy advisor for the European Union External Action Service, the foreign policy wing of the EU, and Dr. Elisabeta Kitanovic, Executive Secretary of the Conference of European Churches. We discuss foreign policy frameworks between Europe and religious states abroad, whether religious communities ought to pursue religious rights for other faiths, and finally, where a consideration of religion can be useful in even secular political systems. Thank you so much, Marita and Elisabetta, for joining the Imam and I on what is now our third episode of Worlds of Faith. To begin, Dr. Kitanovic, I wanted to ask you, for those unfamiliar with the institution of the Conference of European Churches, if you could explain its raison d'etre, its imperative, its membership in the broader fold of the EU, and then some of the concerns with which the CEC has been grappling with at the moment, given coronavirus. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me for this interview. It is great privilege uh, participating uh, in this exercise. Uh, the Conference of European Churches is a fellowship bringing together 114 churches from Orthodox, Protestant and Anglican traditions from all over Europe for a dialogue uh, and as well organizations in partnership from around 40 European countries. So we are all doing uh, common advocacy and joint actions with the European institutions. Conference of European Churches has its offices in Brussels uh, and Strasbourg, which are used to link these churches uh, with uh, European institutions like European Union, Council of Europe, and other international organizations like Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and United Nations. The Conference of European Churches emerged from the fragmented and divided Europe of the 1940s and 1950s. Following the Second World War, there was a real need in Europe to overcome political divisions and work for healing and peace. At this time, small group of church leaders who were very enthusiastic in East and West began to consider the possibility of bringing together churches in European countries, separated by different political, economic, and social systems and the agendas at that time. Their hope was that churches could become instruments of peace and human rights and understanding Trudeau a wounded continent. Together, European churches strengthen common witness, act in service to Europe and the world, promote peace, human rights, democracy, and rule of law, and work for the unity of the church. The Conference of European Churches emerged as a peace building effort in 1959 building bridges between East and West during the Cold War. Two more assemblies followed shortly thereafter and the adoption of the constitution in 1964 marked significant moment for the fellowship of the churches in Europe. The 1964 assembly was very important because it was held in the sea uh, at a ship in Brochel to overcome last minute visa difficulties. And you will see that Conference of European Churches has small boat, which actually uh, reflects uh, um, this boat uh, in our existing logo. The original mission carries us to forward uh, today as we continue to work for a human, social and sustainable Europe at peace with itself and its neighbors. Uh, today, CAC priorities are at the moment uh, protection of the environment, then we are dealing with the issues of artificial intelligence and bioethical issues. Then uh, among priorities are human rights, democracy, rule of law, peace in Europe and its neighborhood. As well, we are strengthening ecumenical and interreligious dialogue on the issues of the common concern. Thank you so much for that, Elisabetta. And Marite, I wanted to ask you if you could explain yourself what the role of the European External Action Service is, what's it, what it is entrusted with doing, its imperative, how it fits into the broader mission of the European Union, and then potentially more specifically on the recent initiative that has been launched by the EEAS 
of the European Union Global Exchange on Religion and Society. With, with pleasure and, and thank you very much for the invitation. So um, the European External Action Service is uh, a foreign um, ministry by another name. It uh, was set up to help the EU institutions to, to define its uh, foreign policy projection in uh, le leading on from um, the experience we had with uh, Javier Solana, who was the first high representative. And then uh, this started in 2011. Uh, the idea is that uh, we both have commission officials, EU officials working side by side with national uh, diplomats from the 27 member states. I am one of such diplomats, um, but I've been here for uh, since the very beginning, which has been a, a fascinating journey. Um, what we try to do is to combine both our, should we say, economic muscle with our, with our uh, general policy of um, uh, policy projections in many fields. And Elizabeth just mentioned a, a couple uh, the field that I'm active in is one um, pertaining to human rights, religion, inclusion, and diversity. Mm. And uh, uh, this has been something which has worked its way up the diplomatic agenda for the last uh, 15 years, um, sometimes without us knowing it, because we do tend to think that religion does not, does not belong in uh, in. Uh, uh, in a context of diplomacy, but we have realized that if we are not literate aware, we will, uh, we will actually be ignoring this to our own detriment. And that's why we have started um, doing a lot of awareness raising, capacity building inside to equip our diplomats to be better at navigating the world as is, and not just as we think uh, it is. Um, you asked me about the EU's Global Exchange on Religion in Society, mm -hmm. which was uh, launched last year by High Representative uh, Frederica Mogherini. And the origin of this is a little bit that we have been blind spotted and not wanting to recognize that religion can actually be part of the solution. Because very often when you listen to the global debate on religion, it's about repression, it's mm -hmm. about polarization, it's about violence. Whereas if you take the microphone away from the, that very vocal and at times very violent minority and, and pluck it in further down at the level of grassroots and civil society actors, you sometimes see a quite different picture. And for us as diplomats, and especially those of us who sit very far from, from the ground, it's very important that we are um, aware that there are things out there happening that does not need our intervention or empowering, if you would like, but where we need to make sure that we give voice and visibility to those civil society actors who want to work together in the spirit of wanting to live together in different minority and majority settings, um, managing uh, global, uh, managing uh, uh, cultural diversity in a globalized setting, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why uh, this initiative was taken and we are now in the process of, of rolling it out. The new HRVP, uh, Joseph Borel, has uh, taken on board um, Mogherini's baby, as it were. And uh, we have just appointed an advisory board to help us in doing so, because we are very conscious of the fact that we know what we know, but we're also quite aware of there are lots of things out there that we don't know. So the reason for this is to look at the way that religion as part of civil society, not a standalone, not a static, but something that plays a role for many people and that can add to building bridges and building understanding, we have wanted to organize a concrete initiative which will involve physical exchanges, virtual meetups, and where we will be talking a lot about a lot of different topics which do not pertain to religion per se, but where faith-based actors alongside and uh, more secular uh, voices have a contribution to make. Excellent. Now that we have the context for both of your respective organizations and sub-organizations, Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you about what is potentially a, quite a controversial matter, but the Roman Catholic Church's reclusion from the Conference of European Churches on the grounds that the organization does not recognize the primacy of the Catholic Church. 
And I think that speaks to a broader difficulty with both intra and interfaith cooperation. That is, while the incentive for cooperation and union may exist for comparatively marginalized religions and denominations, it's unclear potentially why dominant denominations and religions would accede to similar concessions. So I guess my question is twofold to you. One, do you think this is a problem in the first place? And two, how do you come overcome these sorts of dynamics which exist within faiths that you're experiencing at the Conference of European Churches? Thank you, Michael, for this very interesting uh, question. Conference of European Churches cooperates um, with Catholic Church via various church bodies. Uh, like Comite, the Commission of the Bishop Conferences of the European Union, which is made of bishops who are delegated by the Catholic Bishops' Conferences of the 27 member states of the European Union. Then we have a CCEE, uh, which is the Council of the Bishops' Conferences of Europe, which is a conference of the presidents of the 33 Roman Catholic Episcopal Conferences of Europe. And then uh, also our organization cooperates uh, uh, and have regular contacts uh, with the Holy See, uh, which has representation in Strasbourg, in France, uh, especially within the framework of the Council of Europe, as they have observatory status in these international organizations. On the level of the European Union, we have the Article 17 of Lisbon uh, Lisbon Treaty, or Treaty of Function of the European Union, which invites churches uh, for, uh, and religious communities, philosophical and non-confessional organizations to engage in dialogue with European institutions. So CEC and COMETSE do organize together dialogue with European institutions on the issues um, which are of the common concern on the various sectoral policies of the European Union, like climate change, human rights, rule of law, anything which is on the agenda of the EU presidencies. That means that every six months, uh, different member states of the European Union holds the presidency of the EU. And CEC and COMETSE, they produce a common paper where two organizations bring their priorities from the EU presidency agenda in a coherent form. And uh, then they organize, uh, let's say, a physical meeting with the presidency uh, and uh, they are discussing what are the issues of the common concern and what are the solutions also, which are coming from the deep uh, church uh, context, which can be applied in order to help also the European Union uh, to solve uh, or to advance uh, certain issues uh, related to the challenges that are discussed uh, on, on the agenda of the EU presidency. So for sure, uh, there are also issues where CAC and COMETS, they have different approach towards the issues, but as usually, they are overcome in a good fate. Thank you so much for that. And before I bring the Imam into the fold, I wanted to pick up on Elizabeth's comment on building bridges within denominations and, and, and within faiths, and then follow up on a similar matter, Marita, at the level of without faiths and in the civil society layer. So the claim of the EU global exchange on religion and society is that in the words of the exchange's high representative, there are people of faith who have chosen the path of respect and coexistence, not in spite of their faith, but because of their faith. And while this may be true, there is much in both religious doctrine and practice, which is obviously perceived as foreclosing or inhibiting coexistence, irrespective of this underlying intent. Given this, Marita, I wanted to ask you, do you think it may be more prudent to search for other grounds than religion upon which to cultivate this sense of mutuality? And if not, what is the role of religion specifically where potentially there are other mechanisms where there may be broad gestures towards human rights writ large or your respect for human dignity or nationhood, these other alternatives? Where do you see religion fitting into this picture? Oh, thank you very much for that very simple question, which I'll try to <laughs> unpack. <laughs> um, when Federica Mogherini uh, put her words as she did, she wanted to say that we, there is sort of an expectation that religion is always on the side of trouble. But mm -hmm. here saying it is precisely because of the background, the motivation, the aspiration, that they bring out their religion in good faith. And as we sometimes say among ourselves, there's a lot of good religion, but there's also sometimes a lot of bad faith. 
And this is our challenge as diplomats to know our place, to navigate, and to know who to partner with and where to step aside. We are not and will never be experts on religion per se. But what we need to understand is religion is not something static, is not something that sits in a church, in a mosque, in a synagogue. It's something that's lived. And what we want to understand is very close to the local context. How does that play out in different terms of statehood, citizenship, and a sense of religious belonging? That is, in fact, the title of a training that we are running at the end of this week for 25 diplomats uh, inside um, my organization and where we will unpack this. Now, why do we bother to look at religion? We do that because we know that aspects of religion is very relevant to today's world. And aspects of religion gets played both by faith-based actors, as you just alluded to, but certainly also by certain states who have found out that religion is sort of the new soft power that they can project. And it's actually not that new. It's just that we are late to the game. So we are realizing that this is happening. Our duty then is to understand how does that impact our policy goal of creating inclusive, tolerant, and democratic societies. How do you go about that? If you have a state which gives in to a degree of sectarianism, which serves on the rise of, I would say, this post-COVID ethnic nationalism, and give in to this kind of, we, we are more there for some than we are for others this kind of kinship democracy. How does that fare? And of course, we are not in the business of promoting secularism, but we want to understand what happens when the state takes, takes side. And we've seen that increasingly around the world, including in our own societies, where you have a sense that some citizens are more first class and others are second, if at all. We've seen how certain states now start defining themselves in terms of religion, We've seen what Modi in India wants to do. We've seen things in Israel, Australia, you name it. It's not uncommon to, to including to countries that are close to ourselves. So understanding that when we are in the business of promoting democracy and shared citizenship, can we do that without knowing how this fares when you put on a religious lens? Now we do that not because we want to increase the role of religion because that's clearly not our, uh, our job either, but we want to make sure that people's different sense of religious belonging doesn't get caught in between this. And this is today very much a challenge. How do we make sure that we have human rights for all, that we have freedom of religion and belief for all, not just for some or not just for the majority? How do we make sure that there's real equality, real inclusion, and that, I think, is when we start unpacking the social contract of how we live together, how much space is there for the differences. And we need to know that we have a special duty to minorities. We can always be a minority somewhere in the world. But if you let majority rule, we all know the problems of that. And that's why um, we don't overinvest in religion or give a blanco check to faith-based actors, but we listen and we try to make sense of who are the ones that we can partner with in creating what I said is our policy objective of being finding more inclusive and democratic societies. Mm. And I guess more tangibly then, thank you so much for that answer, Marita, but tangibly on the ground, Imam, as a religious leader of what is a minority religion, Shiism, how do you stave off these imputations of division which often come exogenously? They come from outside. They come from perceiving of the Iraqi, the Iranian state, what's happening with sectarianism as Marita so aptly synthesized around the world, presumptions of exceptionalism of specific religions. As a religious leader in a Western context, how do you stand as an individual against the force and the weight of that media presence and the weight of the presumptions which undergird 
being a religious leader in the first place? And what do you think your role in that, in generating that compatibility between the rights of all and the rights of your specific religion as a religious minority are? Thank you so much for that. It's quite a complex question. But in short, I'll, I'll give you the answer, then I'll, um, then I'll go about unpacking it. I'd say that if we spend time in just focusing on eradicating or countering the negativities, I don't think we'd get anywhere. I think the most practical thing we can do is practical work on the ground. And the last five years or so has shown us that. The ability to come together, to work together, and to develop friendships. Now, starting from the beginning, you see, Islam is a fledgling religion in Europe and most probably in the Western world. Its history doesn't go beyond 100 years. You know, prior to World War I, Islam was really the enemy of the Christian nations. You've got the, you've got the Ottoman Empire and so forth. After the decline of imperialism and these empires, um, what you do find is that Islam finds its way into Europe. And it's not until very recently that Islam has come onto the surface again. So in the 20th century, at least Europe felt that religion didn't play a part as much as it said that it possibly may play a part. And then the 21st century sees a religiosity that has defied expectation. So within that kind of context, what we're now seeing is a new situation, something very unique. So I don't blame institutions for not understanding where to place religion. I don't blame countries for not understanding where religion fits in. The 21st century, especially 9-11, has been a watershed, and it's seen fundamentally a, ri a rise in religiosity. Here in Europe or the United States, you've seen people believing in God increase, if not following a formal religion. So when certain parameters are changing very rapidly, again, we as religious leaders don't have the resources either to be able to change. If, if countries cannot understand this quick movement, then it's, it's an uphill struggle for religious leaders to do so. What we do find though is that, look, what is religion? You know, if I look at it from the prism of Islam or Shiism, religion is meant to take care of two things, the material and the immaterial. The immaterial is our relationship with God and the material is our relationship with humanity at large. And we've seen in the last couple of years that this also includes the environment. So I'd say the last seven hours in the last week of, of my life has been spent in meetings in relation to the environment in relation to ecology. And that's a new field that, for example, that I find myself in. Because bearing in mind most of our structures are in the Middle East or in the East, it's new for communities, Muslim communities in the West, who are facing these challenges. And it's very simple. Why is that? Because I may be second or third generation. However, in the 20th century, leadership was in the hands of those people who were not equipped with the culture of the West. They weren't born into the culture. And so therefore, what you are seeing is an evolution. And for us to get to that stage where Christianity or Judaism is, I think will take a generation. But if allowed to evolve, you will see a very British, European or American form of Islam. And it's rising. It's coming. American Muslims are distinctly different from European Muslims. And for somebody who spent six months of my life traveling between these two continents, you can see that Islam is in one fold. American Islam is different. It is more patriotic. It is more accepting. European Islam, Muslims do in Europe feel like second class citizens. Okay, if we put aside the last three years in North America, let's say, but generally the vast majority of Americans do feel American. And that is because of an overarching um, nationalism, which is there, which is not prevalent actually within Europe. So even though Europe does claim to be secular, mm. why is it mm. failing them in um, opening its doors to, let's say, the Muslim community. So now coming into my own challenges. So I'm sitting in a position whereby I started off my career in Europe and then I came back to the UK. So I was engaging in or with people in Brussels and other places like that. And then after that came back to the UK, Scotland, and now, as you know, the United States, we're also um, working to bring communities together. For me, I've had to invent everything. We didn't have these structures. We didn't have what we do at this moment in time. So we've had to invent things. We've had to make things. We've had to, structures have been there, yes. Within Shiism, there's a hierarchy, which is not prevalent in the Sunni community. However, with those structures, we've had to remold it 
for a more European and a Western context. And what I find it's extremely important for us is when we take the principles of, let's say, Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad, and we evolve those principles into a more holistic um, kind of strategy. And that is what it was meant to be. If I look at Medina in the time of the Prophet, or if I look at Jesus, especially within the Gospel of John, if you look at his kind of overarching holistic view of things, that is exactly what we are trying to model. So it's important for us to be all encompassing. And so therefore what happens is that for us to be inclusive of everyone requires us to do social projects. I've never found theology, um, at least not in the last 900 years, be as fruitful. And I think that that's something that if we want to really start on theology, let's go back 900 years. I believe Europe does owe a huge debt to Islam. And the reason being is that most of the enlightenment and after that technological revolutions actually started off in the Middle East with three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam sat in Cairo or in Baghdad or in Aleppo, and they discussed various things. If you look at some of the teachings of Maimonides today, if you look at even what Thomas Aquinas was talking about, these were discussed a hundred years before him by Christians, Muslims, and Jews sitting together, scientists, philosophers, great thinkers. And so we have a model that 900 years ago we could work together. Now they were working on the basis of intellectual endeavor. Today, I believe it's time for social endeavor to advocate for one another. And you, you know, you've got Elizabeth right there. She'll tell you some of the work that we've been doing together. Um, some of the good work that we've been doing as organizations, including the Jewish faith, coming together to advocate for one another. And that's what's important, advocating for one another. There's no point in me advocating for myself. I feel that in this day and age, we have to advocate for one another. And we were working on a project only last year in regards to Christian minorities. You know, I've put my life on the line in countries like Pakistan, where I still require 24 hour protection. You know, when I, when I was last there, we had complete, you know, armed, armored protection. And the reason being is it's not because I feel that there's a threat, but because individuals who invite me feel that there may be. And, you know, sometimes when you are advocating for other people, there are places in the world which are sensitive to that. I know for a fact, Islam doesn't teach that. Islam doesn't teach marginalization. If you look at Medina, it was divided into 10 parts. There was a part in there for Christians who ruled according to Christian principles. And there was a part there for Jews who ruled according to Christian rulings. And then there was a part for Muslims. And we have a tradition that says that the Prophet Muhammad then said, if you have an issue amongst yourselves, then come to me and I'll resolve it. Mm -hmm. And what he was trying to say was, is that he was well-versed in all of the different books. And so for me, the importance of interfaith starts off in Medina. The idea that we need to be well-versed in each other's faiths to understand each other's sensitivities. And then only then when there's a common ground, can we build friendships. And most of the work that I've been doing with Elizabeth or others, have been because of friendships, because of trust. And if I don't trust somebody, there's no way I can do a project with them because I'll always be watching my back. Traditionally, interfaith has just been about that. It's been very formal. It's been very tick boxy. It hasn't achieved very much, but I do feel now we are achieving things. In the COVID era, you've seen some of the good work that's been done, some of the pots of money that we've accumulated for people in Africa and in Asia. That's come from a religious background. That's come from religions coming together to work on that. And so I think that what our position is in Europe at least, especially when we've gone through this economic blip, is that religions can provide social help, civic help. They don't necessarily need to be in the political runnings or wranglings of things, but even working socially is a political statement in and of itself. Mm. You know, you mentioned a couple of figures at the beginning you talked about certain figures who are in the political arena. What politics does is it does marginalize. So you've seen how politics and political leadership can be polarizing at stages. And therefore, I, if I look at a model today that works, at least within the Muslim world, is the Sistani model of Nejef, because he is not involved directly within politics, even though he is involved. He doesn't take any party position, but at the same time, when he appeals to the people of Iraq to come and protect Iraq, against Daesh, then within 24 hours, 2.4 million people sign. So the ability to have power, to demonstrate power, but not to be directly involved as an art. And I feel that 
I guess prior to 1979, the Shia community did that very well, the scholars did that very well, in terms of being parts of, and I'm not saying favoring one side or another, but we have seen in the history going back 1100 years, the ability for Shias as a minority to survive with governments, with governments who were oppressive, be they the caliphates of the Umayyad um, caliphates or the Abbasi caliphates, or the Ghaznavis or so forth, and even in the time of the Mughals in India, some of them were extremely anti-Shia. The ability to survive and the ability to have your own, and that really was in social work, to help other people to work with other faiths. And I know that the next, and we're going to have. Dr. Chinmay Pandya, who is one of the, one of the most strong leaders in India, we'll, we'll be having him in, in, on the next show. And just, and I know one of your questions to him is going to be how interfaith plays a role. So the Hindu-Muslim relationship or the Shia Hindu relationship within India is quite phenomenal. And it goes back about 600 years. So, you know, in summary, just to piece everything together, I think the solution is really the way that I see it for inclusive communities is the ability for us to work socially together. Uh, one humanity, one, hum one human kindness, one family. And through those social works, especially now in a time of austerity, in this time of COVID, the ability to come together, I think, is what religion and how religion can play a role. Mm. Thank you so much for those insights, Imam. And Elizabeth, uh, the Imam mentioned some of the interfaith projects you're doing together. I wanted to bring the conversation to the comment the Imam made about evolving specific principles of a religion to holistically appraise society, to help society as a strategy. So beyond forging ecumenicalism in the company of churches, do you think there also lies a responsibility for specific faiths to advocate for religious rights writ large beyond the pale of their immediate faith? So to actively push for the observance of religious rights at the state level. As an example that I'll give, the much maligned law against face veils in France has been understood as visiting a specific religious harm against Muslims. What then would be the role of other religions or how do you see the role of the CEC specifically and perhaps bringing in some of the initiatives that you've conducted with the Imam in, in bridging those divides, but also advocating specifically for religious rights of denominations of faiths outside of your own Thank you, Michael, for this very complex question. Um, understanding religion and human rights never was an easy task. Therefore, in the last decade, uh, our organization had developed the program on human rights education to help European churches to deepen the knowledge about human rights instruments and mechanism due to controversy, which comes out from the certain set of rights and uh, also their grounds, uh, which we can find in the holy books. And here I do relate to Abrahamic religions. In the past years, um, uh, Conference of European Churches has included Muslim and Jewish organizations in, uh, in our human rights education program, where we uh, discuss the issues like uh, freedom of religion or belief, freedom of expression, then hate speech and hate crime. As a Conference of European Churches, we have a rule that we don't talk about the person, but we talk with the person. And in this case, we have invited our Muslim and Jewish friends to come and talk about the issues of uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And we have discussed how churches can help in advocating together to eradicate Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and Christianophobia especially now during the time of rising populism in Europe and the world. This huge work cannot be done just in a few meetings, but what we have done so far, we have established bridges, we got to know each other, we became friends with each other. Friendship has opened the doors of having sincere conversations uh, that uh, on the stage are a little bit different. Uh, very often they have very diplomatic form, but uh, what I believe that together, uh, Jewish and Muslim communities together with Christian organizations are able to develop a stronger advocacy for the future and make sure that these breaches are not instrumentalized for any uh, political purpose. Uh, for the atmosphere where we develop these projects, you may also see the videos in the human rights sections of the Conference of European Churches website. 
Uh, another example that I would like to bring uh, what we uh, to get as Muslims and Jewish organization have done together, well, and especially with Imam Razavi, was uh, that we expressed um, great concern over the proposal table in a sliding uh, parliament, all things to ban non-medically indicated circumcision for male children. If the proposal was uh, made into the law in 2018, parents could face up to six years in prison if they have religious circumcision performed on a boy child. This move would uh, not only amount to an infringement of fundamental human rights of freedom of religion and belief, but would also be perceived as a, as a signal that people with Jewish and a Muslim background are no longer welcome to Iceland. As Conference of European Churches, we have understood that for these communities, it is integral expression of faith. Uh, and as CAC, we have supported um, our Muslim and Jewish friends to change the draft proposal of 2018 to ban circumcision in Iceland. Thank you so much for that answer, Elizabeth. And I guess the two strands there are that one, the human dignity is inalienable and it's what binds religion in theology. And second of all, that question of trust and forging trust through action rather than simply on that theoretical level that you mentioned. As the Imam mentioned earlier, politics can be polarizing. So Marita, I wanted to ask you about some of your work since the Arab Spring, which has been on this vexed interplay between politics and religion. Bearing that in mind, much of Western academia, of media, of analysis, which treats this intersection between politics and religion, especially at the state level, considers religion through the lens of realpolitik. That is, religious ideology at the state level is understood as an instrument through which religious leaders advance themselves politically, as the imam mentioned earlier, rather than a genuine end in and of itself. As an extreme example, again, as the imam mentioned, figures like Hassan Nasrallah and Ayatollah Khamenei are often perceived and analyzed as charismatic politicians, first and foremost, who extract their legitimacy from religion, rather than clerics whose intent is to fulfill a religious mandate. Equally in Latin America, the influence of the Catholic Church on governance has been appraised through this lens of power seeking, of expanding its base. So my question to you then is, do you think it may be useful for policymakers to think of religion as more than this political instrument in state and civil society building? And if so, how, when so many of the intentions, the incentives seem to be ones of power and seem to be considerations of politics? I listened uh, just now very carefully to what was said both by Elisabetta and Imam Marsavi on, on the practical work and, and some of their reflections on, on why we need to know our history and why we need to uh, be aware that uh, it's sometimes not theology as such as it is diapraxis is, is, is doing social, social action. Now, um, from our perspective, we are not in the business of wanting to politicize religion or to religionize politics, but we do look around the world and see that some political parties draw motivation, tap into the reservoir of people who identify themselves through uh, first and foremost faith as a, an expression of their um, political aspirations. And, um, and that takes different, uh, uh, different expressions from, from Asia to Egypt. We've seen very different models. And I think it's important for us as policy folks to understand what's behind all of this. What is it, what is it what, when certain regimes use religion for legitimacy purposes, for beefing up? What is it, what kind of freedom and autonomy does that leave religious leaders with? Uh, have institutionalized religions just become another political tool? Or to try to answer your question, where is the more genuine or pure form of, of, of work done by uh, faith-based actors and in particular religious leaders? Now, there I am on thin ice also because we do not go into uh, close cooperation with religious leaders per normally. We are often um, invited 
to be observing when different faith traditions uh, try to work out their own um, faithful rites, their own living together modules. And I thought it was interesting that Imam Rasavi mentioned Medina because we all know the Marrakesh Declaration and how that was, uh, that was uh, brought to a prominence some years back and where some would argue that the politics also got involved in that. And that's why I think it's very important for us to know our limitations, to say we know that what we need to look at is religion in society, religion and social inclusion. Where are the, where are the levers where we can, first of all, do no harm, but also maybe contribute to those bridges being built? And one of the things that I know the EU uh, is good at is our ability to convene. And we have, we have had uh, examples where we have convened people, including from Iraq uh, uh, some years back, where religious leaders from all denominations came together and where some said, you know, had it not been because of your intervention, we would not all have been meeting around the table. And that's something where the EU should not be, should be very aware of the the power of attraction, the trust that we have. Um, uh, we are not per se a colonial power. We have members who have been, but we do have a policy projection where values and interests uh, go hand in hand. But really where we are looking to the projection also of our soft power, even if some would say that we have at times forgotten that. But we also are in a world where we live uh, and we see uh, exclusionary politics as a global phenomena, including ourselves. And, and this is why I find very interesting the comments by Imam Rasavi on Islam in Europe. Who speaks for Islam in Europe? Is there European Islam or is there Danish Islam? Is there a Dutch Islam? Is there French? How, what happens when you start parceling it off? What is the reaction that you sometimes get from others saying, you are not to speak about Islam, only Muslims can speak about Islam, and there is only one Islam. And what do you then do as a policy person in the middle of that and say, through our initiative, for instance, we're also going to look at how we live together in Europe. We've conducted um, uh, case studies and, and interviews from Denmark to Portugal, from Poland to, to, uh, to the UK. And it's very clear that there are different sort of senses of comfort with different religions. So what happens in countries that are majority, I wouldn't even say, I mean, Catholic or, or Protestant because it's cultural Christians, cultural Christianity that matters. What happens when other, and minorities start voicing their concern or their contribution. And it is seen as either a threat or you tend to categorize one religion as mostly related to peace building and another one mostly related to stirring up trouble and violence. What, what, what is it that is behind these stereotypes? And that is some of the subtext of which we work on. Clearly, as the European External Action Service, we are not mandated to work inside our own countries but in today's world, you cannot separate it. And that's why the link between what happens in Pakistan and certain parts of the UK, what happens in Bangladesh and so on, you, you can go on. We have to understand that better and be able to, to, not to instrumentalize, because that's not our business, but just to make sure we understand so that we are not played either. And I think we have come a, a, a quite a far way. Uh, I mean, I'll let others be the judge of that. But together with, with uh, a former uh, U.S. State Department colleague and a good friend of mine, Peter Mandeville, we set up uh, five years ago, ago uh, a network of diplomats who, who work on the interface between religion and, and, and diplomacy and how it impacts foreign policy and also development policy, SDGs, et cetera, et cetera. And that has helped us stand shoulder to shoulder and do some some, should I say, um, cluster learning, where we have been able to bring the awareness and the capacity up to a level where at least now we know how to ask the right questions. 
that mm. is not necessarily the case. We did that before. And I think in all modesty, that's not a small step. Um, and when we know how identity politics sometimes get a grip of certain countries, uh, including some of the ones that we have in our transatlantic policy network, then it's very good that we can stand shoulder to shoulder and say, hang on a while, is this really the way you go down? And, and I think we are sometimes um, over-focusing on some religions and totally forgetting what's happening with the spread of evangelicalism, for instance, in, in Africa and Latin America. And that's one of the things that we have been looking into and actually commissioned paper and put them on our website so that we can share with others. Because if we become obsessed, and in particular obsessed with Islam, I think it clouds our understanding of, of where, where Islam is going. And, and to that, it's for Muslims to define. But Imam Rasavi said, and I like that, how come you're so secular that you cannot leave space for others? Well, what, does, what has our secularity actually become if it is there's only space for sort of the cultural major majority? And there, I think there are some very interesting things to learn, not necessarily from where the media is very focused, but where you hear less, Portugal, Germany, and not necessarily France or the UK. Yeah. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive answer, Marita. And I'm very acutely conscious that you guys have already de dedicated an enormous amount of time to this. So I want to wrap up with a question which I think ties this conversation together quite nicely to you, the Imam. Specifically, I wanted to ask about protecting other people's religious life, rights, but on the note of what Marita was mentioning towards the end about identity politics becoming a fissure within the political scene, I wanted your insight on how it is that in a place like England, where Shiism is obviously a vast minority, you can mobilize politically the Shia community behind the basis of the marginality of the Shia community. That is under the understanding that they aren't potentially granted full rights in all domains and aspects of society without making that a fissure within the society, without making that a basis on which you differentiate between someone else, but something you push for for yourself and push for out of your religious intensity and conviction without generating a schism. So as a religious leader, where do you think your role is in mobilizing without segregating, without dividing, without generating these artificial synthetic political fissures that Marita is so aptly gestured towards earlier? A fully, fully loaded question that needs to be unpacked. But I must say that, you know, I was really listening intently to what Moretta was saying. And um, I'm just going to start where I think she raised one or two things and then can move in from that into your question. I do feel that when we talk about re European Islam, I think that parameters need to be given. And parameters generally are given on the basis of culture. Um, in answer to your question very, you know, very comprehensively, I would say that in England, because we're third, fourth generation, our culture is English. And even though it may be English, but you still see a huge divide between the Scots and the English. Muslims in England feel like second class citizens. Muslims in Scotland don't feel like that. Perhaps they've been there for a hundred years. But when you speak to a Scot, and the vast majority of Muslims in Scotland actually support SNP, which is quite funny as well. So they're, they're in for independence. And when you ask them why that is, it's because of the sense of belonging. Muslims feel that they belong in Scotland, where Muslims in England don't feel that they belong in the same way. And I think that that's very important. Language plays a huge role. Culture plays a huge role. Yes, it's important if I live in Bradford to know what's happening in Pakistan. But if I'm living in Edinburgh, those people who are ethnically identifying themselves as Pakistani were actually born in 1945 before the creation of Pakistan in Scotland. And so the vast majority of the so-called Pakistani or Pakistani Scottish individuals are not actually born in Pakistan. They were born in India pre the creation of Pakistan, let's say. So their affinity actually is only to Scotland. And their understanding is only to the cultural dynamics that takes place in Scotland, maybe slightly more in England. So the English, or, the, or I'd say 
United Kingdom is a completely different model from the European model. And I think at the moment, if you, let's say if I'm in France, if I'm to understand Islam in France, it will require me to understand Islam in North Africa, especially within Tunisia and Morocco. So those, those countries which are French speaking in Africa, um, maybe a bit of Lebanon as well. Uh, in Germany, there's a huge movement of Turks and I'd have to understand what's taking place in Turkey. How, let's say, since Erdogan came in, has there been the rise of, or Islamification of a secular system that Ataturk wanted to introduce? So I guess every European country is very unique as well. However, there are strands which you can bring all of them together. There's certain commonalities which are there that needs to be identified. Can we see one person speaking for the Muslim community in Europe? I don't think we can do. Can we have an institution like CAC? Well, we've been working on it for the last two years. Whereby, and thanks to the support of CAC, in fact, just to look at certain ways of structuring ourselves. How can we do that? How can we have five, six or seven representatives of the Muslim community sitting on a council? And that's something we've been exploring. And that's something which is evolving. Now to bring it to the UK. How does it work for us? How are we able to politically mobilize? It's because we speak the language. We know the culture. And I, you know, very, very candidly, many a time I've been in a meeting, but without mentioning names, certain individuals have said, you're one of us. You studied in the same schools as we studied in. You, went, you played rugby with us. You went to the same universities as we went to. So therefore you're one of us. You speak our language, you know our culture. And I find that extremely racist. But at the same time, it is something that when I've been to numerous meetings has been raised. How do you impact a community, a society, is when somebody identifies you as one of them. You're culturally, in terms of language, in terms of background, in terms of the ability to be able to know what another individual thinks, their, how their pulse, your ticks, so I guess that's one thing, you know, the one way is, is that we, at least in the United Kingdom, Scotland more so than England, have the ability to be able to be one of us, so to speak. That's one thing. So when you're able to do that, that's also, that's also half of the battle there. It's the same with anything. You know, today, you know, I remember when we were having the discussion with the chief rabbi, the Safadi, he was Arab. The ability to speak Arabic is enough to bridge a gap in Iraq is enough to bridge gaps in Syria. At that stage, people don't look at Israel and Palestine. They don't see him as a Jew, they see him as an Arab, a person who speaks Arabic from that culture. And I think the very same thing applies in other places as well. Sometimes you can transcend religion because of your cultural background, because of who you are, the language that you speak. So I think part of the success has been just that, the ability to engage with government at the language of government the ability to understand government from a political and a legal background does help. And also what helps is the fact that you can go for supper to a fancy restaurant and order the very same thing and eat in the very same way as your counterpart would be able to eat. And I think then to have the discussions, and again, as I said, it comes down to friendship. Mobilization of a community also, one must understand that the Muslim community in the United Kingdom is not a young community, it's not a fledgling community. It's quite an old community. And our youth and our professionals have been good at integrating to be able to advocate. The one thing I don't understand now, and I'll, and I'll be very honest, is why this generation, the younger generation, who are born and bred in the United Kingdom, and in fact, even within Europe, are more religious than their parents who migrated. And that's something that even I don't understand. It's not, it's something which is completely different. If you look at women now who are wearing hijab, those girls who were born after 1990, more of them are wearing hijab than their sisters, older sisters or mothers or grandmothers were. Why is it today that Turks, let's say, within the United Kingdom are more religious than their grandparents were in Istanbul? Why is it today that in France, the Moroccans or the Tunisians are more religious at this generation than their grandparents or their parents were? And that's a question that I can't answer. The only thing I look at is 9-11. Perhaps it's the media and Islamophobia that's led to another reaction. And, you know, and that's the only answer that I come up with, that it's maybe Islamophobia, which has led to, as you were saying, identity, this fight for identity, what defines me? 
And because that culture isn't there anymore, if I'm second or third generation, let's say my grandson or granddaughter, the only thing that they know about is the fact that they're from the United Kingdom. So their only identity then, if they're treated as the other, is Islam. And Islam is not a culture. Islam is a faith. So then what happens? Then we have to develop a culture very quickly. So, so I guess there are multiple issues that we're facing at the moment, especially in identity politics. What, how do I recognize myself? Who am I? What, culture, what cultural background am I coming from? And this is why I said that the UK will have its own culture, Islamic culture. The Americas do have this, and Europe eventually will have its. The only thing that's stopping it is the idea of the other and Islamophobia. When you treat someone as the other, you block their development. You block their integration because they feel that they have to defend themselves. And that's why in Scotland, it's not the case. There's an integration that's gone on very fast, which is not the same in Wales or in England or in Northern Ireland. It is in Ireland now slowly and in the United States or Canada as it was, and it will continue. Their integration is much faster. So I find that the integration in Europe and England is slightly less of that speed and it will take maybe more than one generation so really to sum up what you were saying the idea of mobilization we're not out here to divide people what we are out here to do is to bring people together on one platform we do not go into any project without having wider representation and i think the shia community has always been affected because we've taken the sunni community with us at least with the uk government that whatever's been pressing to us let's say for example the opening of places of worship after this COVID, uh, you know, as we go into phase two. We were very, very open in having the Sunni community with us shoulder to shoulder in that. And we were discussing continuously with the communities. We may have theological differences in the Middle East. Yes, there may be sectarian issues. Yes, there may be people killing each other over there. But the reason why I've always said, let's put the parameter on is because let's take care of issues in Europe or in the United Kingdom or in the United States or in Australia, let's say. If we're going to open up the franchise, and look at everything that's taking place, it's very difficult. The average person in London does not know what's happening in the Middle East. And that average person's port of knowledge happens to be the BBC because they're ethnically linked to India as opposed to being linked to the Middle East. They don't speak Arabic. So that's why I think it is important to say, look, let's focus now on Muslims, let's say in the UK or in Europe or in the United States or in Australia independently because I feel that the only solution that's going to come is if we look at it independently. So yeah, so it has to be inclusive. Mm. We have to take our partners um, on board. We have to move together. If we individually try and do something, I don't think it lasts very much. It doesn't last. As the governments change, you'll find people are the flavor of the month, then tomorrow they won't be. As government policy changes, in the same way that you find that whatever we're fighting for today, it's not going to be there tomorrow. The only way we can do it is together. And as this wave of populism is spreading, let's say, and it's spreading under the radar and COVID has disguised much of that. But I think the only way we can counter, and you know, okay, to be, to be a nationalist is not a bad thing. To be a nationalist at the expense of other people, that's when I start becoming anxious. To be supportive, to be proud of the fact that you're Scottish or French, or German, it's not a bad thing. When you're marginalizing other people, that's when it starts becoming a bad thing. Mm. How can we appreciate our national nationality and at the same time accept somebody else's? And I think that's where we can gain a lesson from religion. Because what interfaith has shown us, I can be Muslim and be respectful and very appreciative of Christianity. How can nationalism be played in the same kind of template now? I think I think the UK and Europe can learn very much from religious dialogue, because as we move further and further right, have a look and see how we're doing conversation. And we may not get it right all the time, but I do feel this COVID era, this three months has shown how religions can work very well, not just by promoting one another, but actually working to help those people who are suffering in this period. Mm. And that's really how I feel we need to go forward together shoulder to shoulder otherwise we're not going to be successful mm. well thank you so much elizabeta marita sayed for what was such a fruitful discussion and i think this discussion in and of itself is testament 
to the groundwork which can be laid between bridging the divide between diplomacy and politics, between mobilizing churches at the European Union level, between an imam in, in, in the UK and, and between just a student uh, sitting in Australia. So thank you for your time, your generosity, your insight. And hopefully this is a conversation which continues to develop.